every budget, we ask veteran global investors their view of India's prospects as an investment destination and what they want from Indian policymakers or even from the budget. Joining me today on what the world wants from India is Russell Napier, veteran economist and macro strategist, formerly with the CLSA but now better known as the co-founder of the market intelligence research site, ERIC, and author of the macro report, Solid Ground. Russell Napier, thank you very much indeed for joining us in what are very important uh, moments or uh, periods when Indian policy is analysed. Now, before I come to the Indian policy, Mr Napier, uh, you were the first to forecast that uh, the world will head into an era of inflation. But now that many of the global central banks, important central banks have hiked rates, would you say the near-term fear is recession rather than inflation? Well, you can have recession and inflation. Yes. It, would likely be, it would likely be lower inflation, but it would still be inflation. So clearly there is a risk of inflation. The question for investors is how negative would a recession be for stock markets? Okay. Stock markets have fallen a long way ahead of this recession. They always fall ahead of a recession, but not usually by, by this magnitude. So really the key question we're asking is just how bad a recession will be. Uh, and we have a little template of 2020 when we had a really... Uh, in terms of its short-term duration, short but huge magnitude recession and had very limited impact on the equity market. So what we're talking about is a new form of recession or really an old form of recession. And that is one uh, today where there's lots of government support, huge amounts of fiscal support, huge amounts of subsidies on energy, now massive interference in residential property markets, huge interference in banking by governments. I think the net situation with that is that we don't get a recession which is particularly bad for corporate earnings and certainly not one that threatens uh, insolvency as the last three recessions uh, seem to have done or at least the market thought they had done. Uh, so I don't fear the recession as much as other people. It will bring down inflation. It will bring down short-term interest rates. The impact on corporate earnings, I think, will be more muted certainly in the last three uh, and therefore it's not going to be particularly bad for the equity market. However, it does raise serious long-term structural issues about the relationship between government and markets. Uh, and I think that's more of a, a bigger long-term issue and ultimately more important than the magnitude and duration of this recession. Uh, can you develop that point further? How do you expect this relationship to evolve? Do you think we hit back to inflation? Do you think the government uh, governments all over the world will continue to pursue negative real rates, uh, which is what you had forecast? Yes, absolutely. The, the call in 2020 was for higher inflation, but it was part of a financial repression. Yeah. And the crucial part of a financial repression is that rates cannot reflect inflation expectations. And I mean right across uh, the yield curve. Now, we have a very, very uh, dangerous situation building up in Japan at the minute. And this may be when the penny finally drops for investors that we realize that governments and central bankers are simply not prepared to live with higher rates. That's not their vocabulary. That's not their language. That's not their statements but it will prove to be the reality. Oh. So the great shock, I think, that could come out of Japan is if the uh, Japanese authorities, and this would be the Ministry of Finance rather than the Bank of Japan, force Japanese investors to buy government bonds, compel them to buy them at a, a yield of today, maybe slightly higher than today. Uh, and then we would realize that the world has changed, that the so-called risk-free rate is an entirely artificial rate, not determined by central bankers, but determined by the government. So that's the second part of financial repression. It's yet to come to pass. Uh, but Japan may bring us to that quite quickly. Okay. Uh, well, in that case, uh, you know, if the uh, central banks and governments more particularly are going to follow a lose money policy, a negative real rates, then we should have inflation back before long, right? Well, inflation is coming down and it will come down further. But if the government mitigates in any way the impact of the recession, then that mitigate, mit, mitigates against crushing inflation. Uh, I also believe that this is part of a larger policy that the government wants inflation. Now, it doesn't want it at the current level. We're talking developed world here. Uh, but it's very happy to see it between four and six because alleviating these crushing debt burdens yeah. is going to need inflation roughly around those levels. Uh, and for your viewers who saw the data out from the United Kingdom yesterday on the scale of uh, the government budget deficit and just how much of that deficit is now composed of interest expense uh, and inflation compensation on uh, index-linked Gilts, 
I, I think we're beginning to realize that the world simply can't live with, with higher rates. So inflation mitigates but doesn't come back to two, doesn't come down to two. The governments want it to stay higher. Uh, and I think that's the new normal that we have to get used to. In that case, what are you advising investors to do with their money? Uh, do they invest in developed markets at all? Would you prefer uh, emerging markets, uh, uh, at least because they follow more orthodox policies? Yeah, so, so yes would be the simple answer to that. Emerging markets find themselves in a very different position because post-Asian financial crisis, they haven't racked up huge amounts of debt relative to GDP or huge amounts of interest expense relative to personal consumption expenditure. China is the exception to that. India is, 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 is quite clearly an undergeared country. It's one of the great achievements of India over the last 15 years that it has grown without a dramatic rise in debt. Now, a rise in debt for sure, absolutely, uh, but nothing compared to the way China has only been able to grow by adding lots of debt. So absolutely looking more at emerging markets, but buying cheap equities. I mean, it is said that the lesson from the 1970s is that equities cannot defend you from inflation. I think we all know how badly they did during the 1970s. Yeah. But actually, the real lesson from the 1970s is that highly valued equities cannot defend you from inflation. Now, when you look beyond the US, beyond the S&P and beyond the NASDAQ, you do find cheap equities everywhere. This is India's problem. India's problem is not a macro problem. India's problem is a valuation problem. It's yes. on about 3.6 times book value. Uh, if we look at the average for the emerging markets, uh, you're looking at about one and a half. So there is a rather big gap in valuations here. Uh, so the macro situation may be set fair for India. Uh, but if the answer is buy cheap equities to defend yourself from inflation, uh, India doesn't feature so heavily on the radar screen as the Indonesians, Malaysians and Thailands uh, of this world in terms of the emerging market universe. OK, uh, so you would wait for better valuations to buy India. Yes, I say that. And I've been waiting for a very, very long time. This is the problem, isn't it? For all of us who are interested in value, we wait for such a long time. Yeah. Uh, I've missed some of the India boat, but at this valuation, it seems too expensive for me, even given uh, the incredibly uh, optimistic macro outlook, I think India genuinely uh, sees before it. Well, a, a union budget is upon us, and uh, there is a call from economists in India that uh, the fiscal deficit should be brought down from the 6.4% this year to at least 5.8% next year. Uh, basically, India spends about 20% of its uh, budget, expenditure budget, uh, only in interest payments. So would that be your call as well, that uh, deficit should be brought down? Well, there are other things you could do. That's not a major change. That's a tweak, I think, rather than a major change. The question for India is, can it sell its government bonds? You know, in a world where I think governments will genuinely be struggling to sell their government bonds. Uh, and of course, the focus would be on the highly indebted governments of the world, which isn't India. So you have to make that bond market as attractive as possible to, to locals, but also to foreigners. So in terms of locals, I think the Reserve Bank of India has followed a very uh, good policy on money supply growth, bank credit growth uh, and inflation. Uh, but so, you know, what do you what's the problem? Now? The problem is the, the inflation generated by the rest of the world. And India is obviously an, an importer of that inflation. Yes. So I would focus on getting in more capital. I mean, there is a wealth of capital now likely looking for a home. We, we call it friend shoring in one form, which is foreign direct investment. I'd argue that portfolio investment is another huge potential flow into India. Uh, I think the equities may be overvalued, but actually the bonds uh, could be quite attractive. Uh, to many foreign investors. So my argument would be not to focus so much on bringing down the fiscal deficit, but to make that bond market uh, even more attractive to foreign investors. It has its long-term issues if you let foreign investors own too much of your bond market, uh, but I think India could find a good financing for that, given its debt to GDP ratio, and what I think uh, is, a, is a sound policy by the, by the RBI. So I think funding it won't be too difficult. If funding it becomes a difficulty because the rest of the world is in uh, such a mess that ca India can't attract capital flows, then that's very different. So we, we have to work at the minute that that tr capital can be attracted. It can be attracted to the bond market, uh, and that should be a focus. Uh, if things get really bad, I mean, capital controls in the developed world, uh, then everybody's going to have to adjust a dramatically new policy to cope with that sort of world. So trying to get into the global bond indexes should be uh, something India should uh, work for. Absolutely. I mean, why not? I mean, India is going to be one of the biggest economies in the world, already is one of the biggest economies in the world. There is capital out there. India needs capital. Why shouldn't it uh, be pursuing some of that capital? So I, I don't think they're the, the only downsides, obviously, in the long run are that that capital can be quite flighty and it can disappear again and that can spike your rates. And 
That's been a long history of emerging markets. I suspect it's why some policymakers are fairly wary uh, of allowing it to happen. Uh, but I would still be in favour of allowing that to happen and to benefit India, to benefit from all the forms of capital that I think are increasingly available if we don't move to a period of uh, capital controls in the developed world. Fair enough. Yes, sir. Uh, that can't be ruled out. Uh, but, uh, Mr Napier, I don't know how closely you look at uh, India, uh, you know, bottom-up. Uh, clearly, you have a great macro view. But bottom-up, are there any specific sectors uh, that uh, uh, attract you? No, I mean, I can't uh, pick sectors. I, what, I, what I can say is that companies, uh, whether they're Indian, American, Mexican or British, that have suffered under the yoke of Chinese competition are places really, really worth looking at. Uh, these companies, I think we're going to be doing less business with China, uh, may get to a fairly extreme form of less business with China. Uh, and to the extent that there are smaller companies in India which have not been part of the the, the kind of long-term rise in valuations because they've had to compete with China. Yeah. That is where I would be looking. So none of the, I don't know enough about India to pick any of the big names that are in the index, uh, but I suspect beyond the index there are companies and those companies should now be able to expand as well. Uh, so you would have better margins and expanding capacity, uh, but I'd be surprised if they were large stocks in the index because mm. I'm not sure that manufacturing or that type of thing that it's been uh, competing with China has really composed a large part of the index. So I think there will be as there are, you know, in all the markets, somewhere languishing outside the index okay. are quite a lot of the winners uh, of the world prior to the emergence of China. Uh, and we should see a renaissance for them. So I suspect there'll be small companies, relatively liquid companies. Uh, they may not have had any visitors from fund managers for a long time, uh, but they could be incredibly good long term investments. OK, we'll uh, do our research on that uh, uh, within CNBC TV itself. Uh, but just the last word on the budget itself. Uh, you did speak about attracting bond investors. Uh, India has gone out of its way with its production-linked incentives to attract the China plus one investors. Is that a, a, a path India should pursue, the policymakers? Yeah, um, absolutely. As I said, there's a lot of capital. China took a huge share of global capital flow for yes. really 25 years. That is up for grabs. If India doesn't get it, somebody else will get it. Mexico looks attractive. I think Indonesia looks attractive. Uh, obviously, some of the other countries have got smaller uh, labor and workforces, but this is India's opportunity. This this uh, growing Cold War creates lots of opportunities. Uh, and I think people of India can see that in terms of the uh, how the prime minister is positioning to be in some way non-aligned, but slightly aligned. Uh, the, the ultimate where the rubber hits the ground in India benefiting, benefiting from all of this is getting this capital uh, and a share of this capital, which is now up for grabs. So that should be the, the focus. Uh, and it's a great focus because it's not necessarily, uh, you know, this is not a government driven investment policy. It's not a government industrial policy. Uh, there is private sector capital ready yes. and willing to come and it will find its own ways and, and based on profit. So this is a, a, I mean, I was going to say a once in a lifetime opportunity, but it may even be longer than that okay. before another job opportunity like this arrives. Just one quick last one, if I may. Is it good to go with gold since you do see inflation persisting? Yes, uh, in several ways. First of all, yes, because it comes down but persists. Uh, secondly, because US interest rates come down. But the most important is what's happening in Japan. And it may be where the gold prices started to perk up a little bit. There are only extreme answers to the problem of Japan. Uh, I have my extreme forecast, and that is that the government forces savings institutions to buy government bonds. But the bottom line of a financial repression is the government gets more involved in telling you where to put your money. Now, that's because your money is probably in a regulated financial institution. Gold is one of the few assets which operates outside that system. Uh, and therefore, I think gold is the is the go to asset in a financial repression. In, in extreme circumstances, it can be confiscated. Uh, we all know that that Roosevelt, uh, President Roosevelt did that. Uh, but it's such a small proportion of global wealth that seems unlikely. Uh, and then we have central bankers, central bankers who are perhaps concerned that America, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Singapore might seize their wealth the way they seize the wealth of Russia. Uh, well, one of the very few assets that you can own yes. uh, and actually hold domestically would be gold. So there are many, many, many things lining up uh, to be very optimistic for the gold price. Okay, the Indian housewife was right after all. Thank you very much, Mr. Russell Napier, for joining us. Uh, everything you say, always worth their weight in gold. We have to take a quick break and thereafter we'll be joined by Brian Jacobson, the Senior Investment Strategist of All Spring Global Investments.